and hand this over to Dr. Ide. He's going to talk about amputations. Yeah. <laughs> Zaza at 8.30 in a, in a damn empty uh, classroom. <laughs> and uh, it was too late to get Uber, so I jogged down here. I swept my ass off. And I want to say a few things that I disagree with Alan about, sort of. Uh, regarding vascular surgeons, what distinguishes us more than anything else, I think, from other vascular specialists and vascular surgeons is, is uh, vascular physiology. There's no IR guy or cardiologist has a clue what the vascular lab is. They don't know what toe pressure, they don't know what waveforms look like. They don't understand uh, pulse ox. They don't get physiology at all. And the, the, you know, we invented the vascular lab. Vascular surgeons invented it. Who in this room knows Gene Strandness? Perfect, my, exactly what I'm talking about. Alan just gave a whole talk on occlusive disease in the lower extremity, how to do open surgery. We didn't say a word about vascular physiology. Now we did it the first lecture. I know you got to talk about it earlier on. But it is critical to what we do. It's what differentiates us. So don't just ignore the vascular lab and try to run down the street and, and follow cardiology or follow our, because somehow they know more about imaging or something because they stand in a cath lab all day. Vascular physiology is pretty critical. The other thing is uh, hybrid case is what distinguishes us in terms of what we can do. It's not that we do good catheter cases or good open cases. It's the ability to create on the job better solutions that mostly are hybrid. The, the most common operation, the biggest growth operation in the last 15 years in vascular surgery has been common femoral procedures. It's how you get to the groin, expose that thing, provide good outflow to the profunda while you do something else as inflow. There is almost no justification for doing a fem-fem bypass or an ax-fem bypass in this era. You can almost always get ipsilateral inflow with some kind of wire and guide wire technique. And that's different when you tie both groins together with a piece of synthetic graft hanging on top of your pubis, that's not really a very good operation. They fail like crazy. They get infected like crazy. They bother you when you're having sex. Nothing's really great about it. <laughs> and this is something important. All right, so think the hybrid case is what really makes us different. We don't do, we don't do two operations that are the same. We don't, have a, we don't just do a list of operations. We don't teach you guys just a bunch of operations. We teach you how to think, and we teach you values and how to apply them to individual patients. But the, but the critical thing is to be creative about solving that person's problem. I've said it before. Alan's heard me say it. We're cobblers. We're not Nike. We try to make a really great pair of shoes one pair at a time. You sit in a room with one patient. You look at their situation. You look at their social history. Are they living alone in a trailer in Tyler? Do they have a family? Do they have things they're looking forward to? What, is their, what are their goals in life? What do they have, you know, what is, what is their life about? You have to get to know a patient as a person before you can figure out what treatment they're supposed to have. Fixing an aneurysm doesn't help an old guy with lung cancer sitting in a trailer in, in Dumas. I mean, you may or may not be benefiting them by doing a procedure. So you got to get to know a patient, you got to know physiology, and you have to think about how to create a unique operation. With that as a background, we'll talk about how to cut somebody's leg off. <laughs> Actually, we could cut this short. <laughs> get it? Oh, let me see. There's something else I wanted to say. Do you know, if you invented a stent, if you go and invent a new stent today, take it to the FDA, you want to get it approved, how successful does it have to be to get approved by the FDA? You know how they define whether it's successful enough to, to pass muster and get stuck on a shelf somewhere so you can go sell it? Six, six to 12 months patent. Well, it's 12 months patent. It has to hit 66%. One out of three can fail within a year. You haven't even paid off your bill. And one out of three of those things have already failed. Now, you're doing fine. You got paid to do your procedure, and you're down the road with your Cadillac. But the patients, one out of three have failed by a year, and you're saying that's great therapy? And you walk in any cardiology meeting, Viva included, and they're up there telling you how great it is. No one should lose a leg because of peripheral vascular disease. That's total nonsense. It's total bullshit. And you guys need to stand up and say it's bullshit. Don't just sit there and listen to these guys like it's OK. You're out there cutting the legs off. There's not a cardiologist in this country that's done an amputation, not one of them. When you do a fempop intervention for claudication, and it fails, and then they get a stent, and then it fails, and then you trash that, and then you go lice them, and they have a stroke, or they die from your secondary intervention, and you cut their leg off or you kill them, that leaves a scar on your back. You don't forget that. Cardiologist couldn't care less. He's going on down the road because he just calls the mop guy. You, come in, clean up my mess. But you've got to deal with it. And that's one of the things that really differentiates us. Can I rant a little more? <laughs>
What the hell? It's Saturday morning. Anybody sitting in here on Saturday morning deserves this. All right. <laughs> Lumsden was on call. Two more amputations. God, I love these commercials, by the way. I don't know if you're getting them where you live. Have y'all seen these things? I, don't, I think they're the greatest commercials that ever came along. That's truly evil. SFA stents are truly evil. <laughs> All right, so there's a, almost 2 million amputees in the United States, four out of five of them for vascular disease, not for trauma or tumors, four out of five for vascular disease, and most of those are in diabetics. They got a tenfold increased risk for lower extremity amputation for non-diabetics. Amputees with diabetes are, this looks like a test question, more likely to be severely disabled, to experience their amputation at a younger age, to progress to a higher level amputation, and to die at a younger age compared to patients without diabetes. So diabetes is bad, diabetes is evil. <laughs> Should this patient have an amputation? Yes. Why? They're on a ventilator, they're on three pressers, <laughs> they've got brain death, They've been on ECMO, dialysis, CRRT. <laughs> Families already made them DNR. Do they need an amputation? You can't decide looking at the foot whether somebody needs an amputation or not. Guaranteed that. <laughs> Case number one, 88-year-old woman. She's on two drips, multi-system organ failure, and she's DNR. How about this one? Should this patient have an amputation? It's hard to know. Stinks, I'm telling you what. That foot stinks. That's a stink <laughs> foot. The back of that heel, Rob cut this lady's leg off the other day. I mean, that's a smelly foot. She's living in a nursing home. She's got fever, leukocytes, pain. She's live and she's having some joy in her life. Yeah, she probably needs an amputation. Generally speaking, gangrene in and of itself is not an absolute indication for amputation. Uh, the, the thing you get a lot is these people are in a nursing home and they've been down there somewhere in Sugar Land or somewhere in a, in a little salt box somewhere where they never get the temperature below 80 degrees. And they've been down there for a couple of years. Family has never seen them. Finally, somebody decides, they drive in, they see grandma, and they see her foot looks like this. And they freak out, and then the nursing home sends them into your place, says they gotta have their foot cut off. The quickest way to cure that is just to put a curlix around it. Because if the family, <laughs> the family can't see it, it doesn't need to come off. A little curlix and some Clorox, and it'll smell better, and you don't see it. It's not hurting anybody. I think I'm kidding, but it's true, isn't it, Alan? I mean, you know, there are times when it's better just to cover it up. <laughs> Indications for an amputation that are unequivocal or unmanageable pain. If you've got pain from your foot that you can't fix with a pill, then you've got to do something about it. If the limb is a source of an adverse systemic effect, which is most likely sepsis or renal failure from pigment nephropathy, then you've got to do something about the source of those adverse systemic effects. A third reason that you might want to cut somebody's foot off is it's an impediment to rehabilitation. You've seen these people who have just been in persistent wound care. They're sort of wound hospice. They're not getting better. They're not getting worse, but they're stuck. They're in a wheelchair. They might as well be on the moon. They haven't gotten out of the wheelchair for a long time. They've got no exercise. They're, they're deconditioning as rapidly as you can imagine. They're losing muscle mass, they're losing the ability to walk, and even if you fix their foot, they'd still be disabled by it. So there are times where you need to cut short that process of just waiting and waiting and waiting because of the deconditioning issue. Uh, sometimes, again, for impediment to rehabilitation. And occasionally, it's very occasional, that cosmesis or slash hygiene, just the fact they got a smelly foot that doesn't look good, that it needs to come off because the people in the environment, usually it's a roommate or somebody living in the house, they just can't live with this thing around them any longer. Most patients don't notice it, just like you don't really smell your own farts. <laughs> okay, how do you select an amputation level? There's no gold standard, really, clinical judgment. There's 15 ways to try to do this, but the easiest thing is if, obviously, if there's a pulse at the joint, if you've got a femoral pulse, AK is going to heal most of the time. If you've got a popliteal pulse, BK is going to heal most of the time. If you've got a Doppler signal at the knee, this was Bob Barnes, who I worked with at Arkansas for many years. If you had a Doppler signal at the knee, you had a very high chance of success with BKA. You can go further and look at, uh, you know, toe pressures for a forefoot. Everybody gets uh, uh, antibiotics. DVT prophylaxis is a pretty big deal. Our uh, vascular patients, people have the highest risk for DVT or amputees. Everybody gets some degree of DVT because you have propagation of thrombus from the site of the amputation up to the next you know, entry level, the next tributary. Whether that progresses beyond that or not is uh, sort of the question. So they all need DVT prophylaxis. Toe amp, racket. I like to do a racket incision that winds up vertical. That is, it's closing from side to side as opposed to a horizontal incision. 
I just think it makes more sense because you kind of want your toes eventually to kind of sit next to each other as opposed to be kind of splayed out like a hammerhead shark. So kind of a, a, what you wind up with is a vertical incision. And I orient my rackets on the, on the first and fifth toe along the sides of the foot. So that the three middle toes, you go down the middle. On the side toes, you come down the sides. This is an illustration that was in Up to Date that I think is, it was actually in a chapter that I wrote that it's a horrible illustration. And I actually had him change it. The problem with that incision, what's wrong with that incision that's on the screen? You basically have lost too much skin. And you guys, I guarantee you'll do this. I can't tell you how many times I've sent a chief resident in to do a toe amp. And I walk in, and they've cut down at the base of the toe. And now they've turned it from a toe amp to a ray amp. A ray amp on the first toe is not a good thing. I mean, that is, you know, your foot, when you walk, you hit your heel, you, you roll up the outside of your foot across the metatarsal heads, and then lift with the big toe. You take the big toe away, and particularly the first metatarsal, you've lost a lot of the important biomechanics in your foot. So you really don't want to lose a metatarsal head if you don't have to. Fifth toe, not nearly as important, but a first toe. If I got to lose a first metatarsal, I'll almost always do a transmet. That you're good, because you're going to come back with ulceration on the second toe because you you wound up sort of creating a botched up foot in the way it functions. I see a red light, but I don't care. <laughs> don't look at that. This is the key. Those arrows point, kind of cut up on the toe itself, so that by the time you kind of lift the toe out, disarticulate the first metatarsal joint, metatarsal phalangeal joint, now you've still got enough skin to close it. Otherwise, you wind up with something that looks like that. That's bad. That's a ray amp, and that's not going to do as well. Uh, ray amp, you know what that is. You can, you, know, we, you can look in books about how to do a Lise Franck or a Chopar. I think it's a bad idea to palm all this stuff on, onto podiatry. I mean, people like Joe Mills down here, you know, there are people, uh, uh, Rich Neville, people have worked on this stuff for a long time. It's a, you know, I think knowing forefoot work is important. You'll, you'll save more feet. I looked at a podiatrist the other day. We did a transmet. I looked at this one of our patients. We did a transmet. The whole incision is ischemic black as it could be. The guy's got a running baseball stitch across with interrupted horizontal mattresses in between. If you want to create an ischemic wound, <laughs> that would be the way to do it. Whip stitch a baseball stitch and then put little brackets in between to make sure there's no blood supply in between. <laughs> Crazy. BKA, I think the biggest thing about a BKA that I've learned over the last 15 years has been make it longer than you think. This 12 to 15 centimeters that I was taught, in fact, I put in chapters before, I think is wrong. I think we need to cut these things longer. I don't think you can actually make one too long. I sort of think of it as the bone is in the middle, the junction between the middle and the uh, uh, top third, and the skin flap on the back would be at the junction between the middle third and the distal third. So really, longer BKA is better than short BKA if you can get it to heal. Uh, Bill Edwards in Nashville is very fond of doing sort of sagittal flaps and getting away from this posterior flap that we've all just kind of adopted. And I think he might be right. I mean, I think there may be benefits to alternative amputation uh, styles, and you guys are in a position to figure it out. The uh, through knee is not a bad idea. The quadriceps mechanism, hamstrings come in the back. You know what the knee looks like. In a conventional through knee, you leave the patella and you leave the condyles. In a mazé, which is really the most popular kind of through knee, I think, now, essentially, you, make a, you sort of cut off the condyles. So you create a box. Actually, our uh, amputee, we have one of these amputee specialist guys who works in our office. And what he wants to see is essentially a Q-tip for the end of the femur, so a sort of a rounded sort of a Q-tip. And you get a longer lever arm. So for people who are likely to be ambulatory, or even people that are not going to be ambulatory, but at least they're going to be able to cooperate with their care, a through knee is not a bad option. AKA is fine for the sort of nursing home patient who really doesn't know that Trump is president. Uh, and you, the, you know, people who are disconnected from reality, unable to cooperate with their care, probably just an AK to get them off the table is a good idea. You can see on the right side of the screen, the left side is where the mazé, kind of the square box, and this is sort of more of the round uh, Q-tip end that actually works pretty well. And one of the problems you'd think about with the mazé is, well, how do you get a hinge point? If your knees are at the same level, how do you put a hinge below that and then have your knees at different levels? Well, these engineers are clever, I'll tell you. They figure out how to make the hinge actually sit behind it. That little white thing is a vacuum plug. So when you stick your leg in, all the air you got to let out the side. So it sneaks out the side. And it also allows you to push that button. When you pull it off, it lets air in, just like if you put a hole in the bottom of a you know, bean can to let the uh, beans fall out. But the, uh, the air socket really makes these things work well. 
The other thing to remember on AK, AK, there is this angle of the thigh. The, the femur doesn't sit just vertically up and down. It sits at an angle like that. All of our femur is going to sit like this. And you really want to keep the femur pulled in. The, what you don't want is this. If the femur sits up, because you've got the, these hip flexors, want to pull the femur up and out. And a lot of these skinny old people, if you just cut off their thigh, sew their fascia together, not long after that, the femur sticks up like this, and you'll be back revising that as it kind of pokes through the skin. And people who do this with some enthusiasm like to put the adductor muscles back on the end of the femur to kind of keep that. And you can imagine the adductor magnus. That's the big muscle that pulls the femur down. And that gets taken more or less completely when you do a distal third, AKA. Doing something to sort of a myodesis or some type of procedure that pulls that muscle over the end of the femur to try to keep it back in the midline is, a, is probably a good thing, in, certainly in patients who have a potential for ambulation. So this kind of myodesis is probably useful. What else? Only 50% of AKA patients are alive at one year. And it's not because AKA kills you. It's, you know, when, when parts of your body are spontaneously rotting off, it's not a really sign of your global well-being. <laughs> and that's what's happening. You're, you've done enough smoking and eating junk that your parts of your body are literally rotting off. So and if you add end-stage renal disease to that, only 25% AKA uh, di uh, uh, renal failure patients on dialysis are alive a year later. Something to think about. It takes a lot of energy to walk with an amputa amputation. It's like walking on stilts. So most of our patients don't walk with prostheses because they don't have the heart and lungs to support it. It's not because their wound hurts. It's because it's like walking on stilts. They've got to get out and jog. These people can't jog. That's why the veterans figure out it's easier to get somebody to push your wheelchair out into that smoking house than it is <laughs> trying to limp out there themselves. Post-op pain. Ischemia, neuroma, bone spurs, infection, phantom limb syndrome. Uh, let me think about it. Ischemia is probably the one you kind of need to think about. Neuroma. Uh, Alan, do you cut the nerves? Do you cut the sciatic nerve back when you do an amputation? I think these are useful things to do, not leave nerves sort of hanging around at the end of the stump. So take the, if you're doing a BKA, take the, the sural nerve, pull it out and cut it off high. I don't know if you, have any of you all done that when you do an amputation? I think those are probably useful things to do. Uh, I'm not sure what you're supposed to do. do you, should you cauterize the end of the sciatic nerve? Should you tie it or you just have to accept the fact that it's going to bleed a little bit? I'm not sure what the best answer. Usually I just cut it off with a knife and transect it and let it retract. But it does, you know, sometimes it's the blood supply to an ischemic leg is these perineural sort of uh, collaterals. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else we got? And complications, 34% incidence of perioperative complications in 3,000 BKAs. 15% return to the operating room, wound infection in 10%, post-operative sepsis in 10%. What percent of vascular amputees ambulate with a prosthesis outside the home? My favorite athlete. <laughs> so it's about, take a guess, A, probably A. I, I think it's probably A. I don't know of any of my patients that ambulate with a prosthesis outside the house. I mean, very few of them do. Uh, and Spence Taylor, this is, you know, Spence, any of you know Spence Taylor, he's at Greenville Health System. He's uh, one of the, really one of the best, uh, smartest leaders in vascular surgery that I know of. He's a really, really, really smart guy, I'll tell you. Uh, but he, he did a really, he's done some great papers on predicting the future of our outcomes in patients. And one of the things they looked at was what, what predicts the inability to ambulate. If you're not walking before you have your leg cut off, you're not going to learn to walk afterwards. <laughs> if you got an above knee amputation, the chance of our patients walking with an above knee amputation is vanishingly small. If you're getting old, well, that hits most of us. Uh, if you're homebound before, if you're stuck in the house, you're not getting out of the house afterwards. You're probably not going to be walking with a prosthesis out of the house. If you're demented, which we can all hope for, uh, you're not likely to get out. End-stage renal disease, not good. Coronary artery disease, not good. Survival, remember, one year BKA survival is somewhere about two-thirds of patients. One year AKA, about 50% survival. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.